Welcome to Living Well with MS. This podcast comes to you from Overcoming MS, the world's leading multiple sclerosis healthy lifestyle charity, which helps people live a full and healthy life through the Overcoming MS program. We interview a range of experts and people with multiple sclerosis. Please remember, all opinions expressed are their own. Don't forget to subscribe to Living Well with MS on your favorite podcast platform so you never miss an episode. And now, let's meet our guest. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a really special episode of the Overcoming MS YouTube channel. I am absolutely delighted to be talking about women's health and MS today. Uh, many of you will know me. I'm Jonathan White. I'm an obstetrician and gynecologist living with MS. Uh, I also work as a medical advisor for Overcoming MS, the UK registered charity. Um, I am thrilled to be um, joined today by uh, two titans in their respective fields, I can say safely. Um, I have Dr. Kate Petherham, who's a consultant neurologist um, based in Sunderland, the northeast of England, and Dr. Siobhan Kirk, who is a menopause specialist based in the Belfast Trust in Northern Ireland. Um, Kate, Siobhan, you're both very welcome, and thank you so much for joining me um, after what have been um, many and plentiful technical issues today. So thank you very much for being here. Um, so I think I might start with Kate if you don't mind, first of all, and say, why, you know, why, why are we all, we're all sitting here, menopause is, is very in vogue, everybody talks about it all the time, I feel like we don't talk about it a lot in MS, but why, why does it matter, Kate, why is this important? So I think it's important because it's common, uh, we recognise that MS is more common in people with, in women, mm. and at any point about 30% of an MS population will be perimenopausal or, or postmenopausal. So it's really important that we're as neurologists aware of the menopause as or perimenopause as potential causes for symptoms and problems. And if you line up the symptoms, if you kind of write a list of the MS symptoms, common MS symptoms and common menopause symptoms, there is a striking amount of overlap. And if we're going to give advice to people about the symptoms that we're trying to treat, then it really makes sense that we understand what the cause of those symptoms are or potential causes, because then we can try and give the best advice and the best treatment. Uh, I kind of pulled out my the kind of top three and I was um, I gave I gave a similar talk on, on menopause at a meeting and actually found out one of my patients watched it on YouTube, which is always a little bit scary. Mm. But, uh, gratified to hear that she agreed with my kind of top three overlap symptoms which are problems with sleep and fatigue yep problems with mood condition and mental health mm -hmm. and problems with urinary and sexual function so I think those are the three common symptoms which are lots of other overlapping symptoms but those are perhaps the top three and so but if if as neurologists we're not aware that these may be driven primarily by hormonal changes yeah. then we may not be giving the best advice as to how best to treat them. So that's why I think it's really, really important. Okay. And for what it's worth, I think you've hit the nail in the head there. I couldn't agree more. This is, yeah, this, this is an absolute no brainer topic. I think it's, it's, it's fantastic to be exploring it. I just don't think we do it often enough. So Siobhan, moving on to you, because I know you'll be wanting to answer this question. What the hell is the menopause? As, as, a, as a general gynecologist who doesn't know very much about anything, but especially about post-reproductive health, enlighten me, please, as to what the menopause is. The menopause is the last menstrual period. So it's diagnosed after a year of no period. So it's often retrospective. Okay. Um, it can happen immediately if both ovaries are removed, um, either on their own or at the time of hysterectomy, um, or in can women can be thrown into immediate menopause if they have chemotherapy or radiotherapy for, for some cancer treatments. The average age of the menopause in the UK is 51. And as far as I'm aware, there is no evidence um, of earlier age in menopause in, in women with MS. The perimenopause is the term given to the months or years leading up to the last period and that can last for many many years so quite often women in their 40s start to have some symptoms which they may not always realize are menopausal that can be heavy periods slightly irregular periods more pms um, headaches mood swings palpitations and um, again some of the same symptoms that that kate mentioned there Mm -hmm. um, one in a hundred women will go through an early menopause under the age of 40, and that's called premature ovarian insufficiency. 
Okay. So uh, given that three and four people with MS are female, that most of them are diagnosed between 20 and 40, this is going to be a, a significant issue for a lot of people living with MS is the fact that their MS came first and then they have to see what the menopause will then do to it. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So Kate, I'm, I'm wondering what, what do we know about the effect of menopause on someone's MS, if that is a fair question? I think it's a really fair question. And the sad thing is, is we don't have very, very good answers. Mm -hmm. So there are some small studies, or most of the studies are, are small, and there have been conflicting studies about a whether menopause has an effect on relapse rate uh, and or whether it has an effect on progression and worsening disability. It's quite complex because as we've kind of alluded to, menopause occurs at a stage in the MS disease course where relapses may be reducing anyway. Yes. And progression may be becoming more apparent anyway. Yes. And we also know that MS being an autoimmune condition, that the immune system changes with age. So mm -hmm. the, the kind of interplay is quite complex and we don't really have the answers, but the overall kind of aggregation of the evidence suggests that there isn't a significant impact of mm -hmm. of menopause on relapse or progression is the bottom line essentially so i think so that, that's that's really helpful so actually then if we're if we're saying okay so your ms may naturally get worse with age but we we think at the moment with our lack of evidence and what we do know that perhaps menopause alone is not something that's significantly driving your ms to deteriorate or exacerbate or progress over time. So then, but, 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 <laughs> but and here's just the put a pattern because, because of the overlap in symptoms and there are perhaps elements which are so relevant to menopause, which we can perhaps talk about as well in terms of symptoms such as hot flushes and heat intolerance, which are again, may exacerbate symptoms of MS so there may not be a biological differences but the symptoms of menopause and perimenopause may influence and make worse MS symptoms which is why I believe it's so important to recognize and point women in the right direction to get the right help. You know that I was actually about to say that. I did know that but I just thought I'd get in there first. <laughs> like what you did there you've taken my thing which is going to be it's a quality of life issue and then you exact you sort of pulled it out and made it much more succinct so well thank you very much for that Kate that was brilliant. <laughs> um, so Siobhan we've sort of touched on this and I, I, I think it would be really helpful if you could explain to us from this sort of the, the gynecology perspective what sort of symptoms somebody may experience specifically with menopause that you as a gynecologist can help with, if that makes sense, as a menopause specialist? Well, the, there's multiple symptoms really, Johnny. Um, menopause affects um, the whole body. There's estrogen receptors in your brain, your bladder, your heart, everywhere. Um, mm. From a gynecology point of view, sometimes, the, as I mentioned earlier, the most common symptom would be a change in periods. Yes. So irregular periods, sometimes more prolonged or heavy periods mm -hmm. um, or, or lighter periods or, or periods stop completely. So obviously there's gynecological treatment options that can, yeah. can help with that, particularly the marina coil. And what about this, the traditional phrase, we use the vasomotor symptoms then of, of menopause? The things yeah, the, the typical symptoms that everybody associates with the menopause, the, the flushes and sweats, particularly night sweats, which obviously then disturb sleep and can have a, a knock-on effect the next day. If you don't get a good night's sleep, you're going to be moody, you're going to be tired yeah. and irritable the next day. So it's all a bit of a, a vicious cycle, really. Yeah. And... It's not going to be a surprise that we're going to start talking about hormone replacement therapy, but perhaps you could explain for us briefly what, what we mean by that phrase and how it may be of use then. Yeah, HRT is hormone replacement therapy, and it's usually fluctuating levels of the hormone estrogen and then eventually lower levels of the hormone estrogen post-menopause mm -hmm. that can um, cause these symptoms. So replacement with estrogen is the most effective treatment. Um, for women who are suffering significantly. Um, progesterone is another hormone that only needs to be added in if women still have a uterus because it's needed to protect the lining of the womb from the effects of estrogen. Yeah. 
and and I, I think I'm right in saying that HRT does not solve all the problems of a woman's life after the menopause, but it can significantly improve their symptoms of vasomotor problems secondary to menopause. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah, it can be life changing for for some women, and um, there is a lot of media hype about HRT at the minute. Yeah, um, more and more women, I think, are having unrealistic expect expectations and expecting to feel better than they've ever done in their life. About yeah. seventy five percent of women, not everybody, will get menopausal symptoms. I think it's important to realise that about seventy five percent of women will have symptoms, and for twenty five percent of those, they will have significant symptoms. Um, and for those women, the benefits of HRT usually outweigh the risks. And I think we'll, we'll get to that. Actually, I think it's really, really important to, to frame some of the, the myths and misconceptions about HRT. But before I do that, Kate, do, do we know anything about specifically, say, people with MS taking DMTs, disease modifying therapies? Do we know anything about the safety of, of HRT in that specific instance? So concern there, or there's no concern essentially that so, and this is I think sometimes the the most important thing we can do as neurologists and and secondary care clinicians is to reassure a woman and their primary care doctor or GP that there is no contraindication to a woman with MS on a disease modifying therapy or not being prescribed HRT, because there are lots of myths and preconceptions about that, but we have no evidence that they interact, and you know a woman should. Be, women's menopause should be treated you know the same essentially um, if, and in fact there was probably I don't know we're going to go on to talk about this as well some other long-term health benefits to HRT such a, which are perhaps you know even more important to women with MS we're talking about kind of bone health risk of fragility fractures kind of cognitive impairment long-term cardiovascular risk factors so I think it's e as if not more important that women are empowered to you know ask or for kind of HRT where it's where you know where it's felt appropriate and I think that's hopefully the soundbite of this entire episode because um I know that Siobhan and I were talking about this before a few weeks ago when we met and um this idea that you're being denied HRT by virtue of having MS from some strange paternalistic view that somehow I mean, I can't, Siobhan, can you, I can't join the dots and see why anybody would deny somebody, but. No, I, I get a lot of referrals. Please see menopausal has MS. And I'm thinking, so what? Give them HRT. You yeah. know, I think it, it's maybe the newer, you know, medication for MS. that so they're worried there may be drug interactions, whether whether that's the, the reason, I'm not sure. So, um, yeah, I it's frustrating. We come across this in uh, lots of things, I think, with in, in both in gynecology and and in MS. But this th that is particular. I just feel it's it's outdated. It's probably paternalistic. It's like the old adage of "Don't exercise with MS." That I was told, even when I was diagnosed in twenty fifteen, yeah. don't put your heart rate up too high. And you just think, well, that that's actually the exact opposite of what you should be doing. And in fact, it's just wrong and outdated. And I feel like it, probably, hopefully, through the best of intentions. A lot of our colleagues are denying people something that could make a huge difference to their quality of life. So I'm, I'm really glad that you're both incredibly direct on that point, and uh, and I hope a lot of people will hear that message. Siobhan, I wanted to ask a few, and this is actually probably for my benefit <laughs> more than for the people listening, but just some of the myths and and commonly asked questions, misconceptions about HRT. If you would indulge me briefly, and you can keep your answer as brief or as elongated as you like, but. One thing that I see in gynae clinics all the time, people saying I've had irregularity in my periods and some night sweats and flushing, and my GP has done a hormone profile. I mean, I hope people can see her face in, in this recording, but I think that answers the question. Is there any rule for blood tests in diagnosing menopause? In younger women, yes. You know, with all the hype about menopause, there's a lot of women in their late 30s thinking that they might be menopausal. Um, so in, in that age group, it is a good idea to, to get a clinical diagnosis with an abnormal um, follicle stimulating hormone or FSH level yeah. that we would go by. Um, British Menopause Society recommend that blood tests are not required over the age of 45 for diagnosis of menopause. You know, so if you're over 45, you're going to be perimenopausal, whether you've got symptoms or, or realize it yourself. 
Um, the, the difficult age group is the early 40s where they probably are perimenopausal and hormones are checked maybe several times and they're normal. Um, in that case, it's always worth a trial of HRT. You know, there's no harm in having a trial and if their symptoms improve, then it's reasonable to continue with treatment. But what you're saying then is that the hormone profile, the test isn't particularly useful anyway because it doesn't... No. Because it it's nor can be normal in the perimenopause, yeah, and it only remains abnormal consistently postmenopause. And you don't base your treatment decisions about HRT based on it anyway. Is that fair to say? Yes. And the same with monitoring treatment. There's not usually any benefit in measuring hormone levels once women are on treatment, but there, there's a lot of misleading information out there and um, slightly unusual practices in some um, private clinics. Yeah, no, absolutely. Okay, thank you. That that's, well, that one's helpful. What about someone who has a family history of breast cancer? This is one that I, I have personal interest in that I hear quite a lot. People saying, well, I can't have HRT because my mother did or had breast cancer, sorry. Yeah, in, in my specialist clinic, I, a lot of my referrals would be for discussions around the, the risks and benefits for, for women with a a family history, if they are thought to be higher risk and they've been referred to genetics for advice about that yeah. and they're having an enhanced screening, then ideally they should avoid HRT um, okay. because there is a very slight increased risk of being diagnosed with breast cancer if you're using HRT. Now, their biggest risk is probably their family history. Um, there's no evidence that HRT causes breast cancer, but if you're taking extra hormones and you've got abnormal cells, then, then the extra hormones can promote the growth of the abnormal cells. Again, it's age dependent. There's no increased risk of breast cancer with use of HRT under the age of 50 for early, earlier menopause because you're just replacing what the removery should still be producing. Yeah. And again, I might be wrong on this, but my understanding is that the risk of breast cancer is much higher in those people who drink excessive amounts of alcohol who are very overweight than any amount of HRT anyway. Yeah. Yeah, a body mass index over 30 doubles your risk of breast cancer is a much greater risk than anything else. Age and being a woman are the other biggest risks, which there's nothing we can do about. We can do on that one. And on the subject of weight gain, does HRT cause people to put on weight? No. As you said, there's no calories in HRT, same as contraceptive pill. Um, and there's your second bite. <laughs> The menopause, you do get changes in your body with the menopause and you're more likely, your body shape changes tend to get more fat distribution round, round the middle. Um, there are changes going on and no evidence of HRT causes that. Um, some older women actually, when they stop HRT, find that they then gain weight. So there, there is some evidence that HRT may actually be of benefit rather than actually causing weight gain. And this is one I don't really know the answer to, but is taking HRT just putting off the inevitable? Are you just going to suffer all of these symptoms when you stop it, whether that be two, three or five years down the line? No, and that, that's quite a, a common reason for women putting off starting treatment because they think they have to go through it at, at some stage. There's no arbitrary time limit for HRT use. Um, mm. And every woman is different. Um, Short-term use of HRT would usually be two to three years at least. It's not something that you're going to stop after three months and expect your symptoms to have changed. What it does is it alleviates the symptoms. So if you stop it and you were still going to have the symptoms, the symptoms are still going to be going to be there. Yeah. Okay. You know, there are some women hold off HRT and don't think, oh, my symptoms are going to go. And then they get into their 60s and realize that symptoms are as bad as ever, but they've missed the boat. The sooner you start HRT, the better, because um, Kate mentioned the benefits from heart and bone protection. If you start at 10 years after the menopause, you, you've missed the, boat, missed the boat a bit for those benefits. And for those people who have concerns about heart, heart risk, dementia risk, those sorts of things, what would you say to them? Well, there's, there's evidence as a window of opportunity. If you start HRT within five to 10 years of the menopause, it can actually be cardioprotective. Yeah. It can improve lipid profiles and reduce um, coronary artery disease. Mm -hmm. Dementia, there needs to be a lot more research done. Um, there's evidence that starting HRT, if cognitive function has started to decline, that it may accelerate that. Um, and again, some evidence that it may be of, of benefit. Um, but again, that's not an indication at present to, to take HRT. 
Kate, I think that brings me really nicely onto something. And I get a lot of queries. One of my roles working with the charities to, to answer queries coming in from the community. And a lot of people will say, should I start HRT because I have MS? Obviously, and I'm female, but and I'm postmenopausal. But do, do you know what I mean? That they're, they're starting to see this, this little pieces of information that are sort of out there. And they see all these wonderful stories that certain celebrities are publicizing. And they think, well, hold on, this might help my immune system. And it might help all these other things that might interact with my MS. What do you think? So I think that is a really, really good question. And I, I still think, and I hope Siobhan would agree with me, that the, the best reason for staging, starting HRT is symptom alleviation. So I think if I didn't have symptoms of menopause, I don't think that would be, there. there is good evidence to suggest that you should be starting HRT anyway. And I think there is, like I alluded to, some benefits in terms of bone health and protecting that and, you know, if people with MS it may be more prone to, to falls and fractures in certain situations that there may be a benefit from that point of view. But but I think really the evidence and benefit from HRT comes in symptom alleviation. So I don't think, you know, I think there've been various debates in the neurology world, should all women with MS be starting an HRT? And I think usually the person trying to argue that loses um, because whilst every woman should be given the opportunity and empowered to, have it if it's going to help their symptoms it shouldn't be something that started without kind of you know clinical need to if that makes sense the other the other thing just to add is that there are some in terms of impact of hrt on ms symptoms do we know it works we don't know but there are some very small studies very old studies showing a benefit of hrt for m from kind of ms symptoms whether that's the overlapping ones we've discussed is unclear uh, and there, there is a study from Denmark, which was a big cohort study, but didn't really show an impact in terms of disability uh, from from having being being treated with HRT or relapses. So it probably doesn't have an effect on disease course. Yeah. So the main reason for taking HRT is for symptom alleviation, as with any other woman. And to be absolutely clear, there's no reason why they shouldn't to try and help their menopause absolutely no reason why they shouldn't and again we should empower patients to you know I think as a neurologist it's probably not my role to be prescribing HRT but it's absolutely my role to be talking to patients about it acknowledging their symptoms has been caused by menopause and you know empowering the GPs to feel confident in prescribing HRT in, in women with MS yeah I I for what it's worth I fully agree um yeah fantastic um, Siobhan, a couple of things that people will ask me, as you may know, the charity that I work for, Overcoming MS, is regards or regards healthy lifestyle and lifestyle modification as a key tenant in managing somebody's MS. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I'll get asked is, I don't necessarily want to take HRT, but is there anything I can take that supplement or dietary wise, is there something I can change that may help my menopause symptoms? Well, for, for some women, there can be lifestyle modifications, you know, stopping smoking, losing weight, um, improving their diet, um, increasing exercise can all help with, with menopausal symptoms. Um, unfortunately, there aren't any weird and wonderful herbal supplements that have been of any benefit yeah. um, for, for HRT or for, for menopausal symptoms. Um, multivitamins, things like that, so they're not going to help, but they're not going to do any, any harm. Okay. Um, other prescribable medications usually would be antidepressants, which not all women want to take, but some antidepressants can help with flushes and sweats and obviously if mood or anxiety are a feature that can be beneficial. And what about this concept of bioidentical HRT? This is becoming a bit fashionable and you, you see a lot of your, your face is, is hilarious, by the way. For the, <laughs> you did, we should just have like, a, like an a, open a, a flag system for your views on things. It's, it's, <laughs> so enlighten us bioidentical hrt is a money-making scam by a lot of um non-medical or pseudo medical people um making up different concoctions blends of estrogen progesterone testosterone um, and selling it for a fortune comes in different forms drops you put under your tongue sprays tablets um, okay. and it's not recommended by the british menopause society it's of no proven clinical superiority to other hrt that is available free on the nhs 
Okay, thank you. That was that was very direct. I appreciated that. Um, and actually, it brings me on to something I think is really good uh, one to talk about. So there's a lot of the the discussion around uh, um, MS being autoimmune. It's bet generally better in pregnancy, as many autoimmune conditions are in a high estrogen state. If estrogen, um, if if it's a primarily female related disease, and sort of following my train of thought here. People argue about the role of testosterone perhaps being protective in MS, less men get it, for et cetera, et cetera. I'm then thinking testosterone has become a very in vogue thing with regards to hormone replacement, Siobhan. And do the two, is there any commonality between the two? Do you think that they meet in the middle? For example, does somebody with MS benefit from testosterone patches with their HRT? I think is what I'm trying to ask. No, I, I don't think there's any evidence for that, Johnny. And current thinking on testosterone replacement in women is there's not actually a medical condition of testosterone deficiency in women. And most women, if they have their levels checked, will have low levels. Mm. And there's no correlation between symptoms and, and testosterone levels. So mm. British Menopause Society just support the use of testosterone um, postmenopausally. For okay. women who have um, distressing loss of libido, and they don't currently support the use of it for any other symptoms, including joint pains, energy, things like that. And okay. um, there's no licensed preparation available in the UK, so some women do use it, but it's the icing on the cake on top of their basic estrogen replacement, um, and they have to be happy to use it off license. Kate, do you have any thoughts on that one? No, I think I would just agree that there, we don't have the evidence. I think you're right. There is some interest and there is a tiny study of men with relapsing MS treated with testosterone gel, but it was a study of 10 men. So I don't think we can really draw any conclusions from that. Uh, so I would agree that, that we don't have any evidence to support the treatment in menopause outside the current recommendations at this time. Uh, like with everything around MS and, and menopause, I suspect there's more re research to be done, but I, uh, there isn't anything more to say on that at the moment. No, I, I think I think that's fair. It, but it is definitely there's definitely a trend. I again think this is to do with sort of celebrity advocates. Mm -hmm. I've noticed a big trend towards asking questions like that. That you know, I simply I, I don't think we have a reasonable evidence based answer for at the moment. But it's certainly not something you should be dipping into for the sake of it. Would be my own personal view. I think uh, with that we would probably ask a few questions that our community have sent in, if that would be okay for you. And we, again, can, I think we're within our rights to say, we honestly don't know the answer to that or keep it as long or as brief as you want. But Kate, I think one of the ones that is important to start with would be that the fact that, uh, and Marta Humphreys has sent this one in, some women I know who are diagnosed after menopause aren't started on a DMD or DMT. And what's the latest we know about the impact on hormones and menopause treatment, the outcomes, how well they work, those sorts of things. I presume that primarily that question is regarding age and DMTs then, if that makes it, I think. Yeah, it does make sense. And it's again, a really difficult question to answer because most of the randomized controlled trials in for relapsing remitting disease modifying therapies have a cutoff age of 55. So by definition, we don't really have the, the evidence to, to know for sure what the effect of, um, you know, menopause and the effectiveness of disease modifying therapies are I suspect we'll get more from that from kind of real life and registry based studies but from a kind of randomized controlled trial we don't it's an area which is really understudied yeah yeah I, 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 yeah fair enough thank you um heat sensitivity and thermoregulation I think are two massive that's where MS and menopause, I think, meet at their most evil. I know that I, I'm particularly, I was saying to Kate earlier, particularly heat sensitive and humidity at the moment, and I'm struggling with that a little bit. Um, what do we know ab about, for example, I'm thinking hot flushes, people with MS, heat sensitivity, Kate, you know, is, is, is that something a concern for people? Yes, yeah, so I think I think people can be reassured that that you know there isn't going to be any permanent damage from hot flushes, uh, you know, causing permanent damage, but it may well trigger what is what many people are familiar with the Ertoff phenomenon, where people get a temporary worsening of their MS symptoms when they're hot. So it can be very unpleasant and disabling if you're getting lots of hot flushes, which again is another reason to identify it and and offer people the people treatment. 
And there are lifestyle factors, you know, so the importance of cooling, air conditioning where it's appropriate and available, cold drinks, and perhaps other lifestyle smoking cessation and, and weight loss. Uh, it, when it gets very hot, I have some patients that use a kind of cooling bed and get yeah. pet beds. Um, and so the similar kind of similar advice, particularly overnight, if people are getting very drenching hot sweats overnight. So, yeah, that would be my advice. But it's not. But reassuringly, it's not going to have any kind of damaging long term. Brilliant. Well, thank you for that. That's really helpful. Siobhan, does and there's a there's a long question here, but I think we've covered lots of it. But I think it's worth just touching on the, the role of the marina, if that's OK, the marina in the US, which I say in the world of Guyana has revolutionized what we do. Perhaps you could maybe just explain what that is and how that may be a part of HRT, what, how it's used. Yeah, the marina is an intrauterine system, also known as a, a coil, and it releases a hormone progestogen, type of progestogen. Um, and it, what it does is it thins the lining of the womb, so it tends to make periods, if you're having them, lighter, shorter and less painful, or periods can go away completely. Um, it's also a very effective long-term method of contraception. And it can be used as a progestogenic component of HRT. I mentioned earlier you need progestogen if you still have your womb. So it can actually give you bleed free um, part of your HRT in the perimenopause, as well as contraception, which can be can be can be brilliant. And then you just need estrogen only HRT. Which which is perhaps, am I right in thinking, one of the most beneficial, least risky in terms of the other potential side effects of HRT. If you were taking a transdermal HRT with the Marina IUS, that's a fairly good way of doing HRT. Is that right? Yeah, well, tran transdermal estrogen is thought to be safer than oral. There is a very small increased risk of being diagnosed with a blood clot in your legs or your lungs if you take oral HRT. Now, it's as rare as hen's teeth and there's for the majority of women, there's nothing wrong with oral HRT, but everybody's mm -hmm. jumping on the transdermal bandwagon line. That's what partly why there's so many shortages of the of the HRT preparations because everybody wants the same ones. There's not just Brexit causing that one. No, no, okay. partly, partly, but it's it's supply okay. and demand. So transdermal HRT, getting the estrogen in through the skin by patch gel or spray, there's no increased risk of blood clots. The, the over 50s with the increased risk of breast cancer and um, it's thought to be mainly related to the progestion with estrogen only HRT there's very little increased risk of breast cancer some mm -hmm. studies have actually shown a reduced risk of breast cancer in women on estrogen only HRT we don't have the evidence really that marina is safer than than other systemic progestogens um, but it, it is a much lower dose and it can also be useful for some women do get progestogenic side effects with their HRT and Marina can be very useful at minimizing that. And in terms of just to just elaborate slightly progestogenic side effects what, what would people sort of? Uh, well if women start HRT and they're still having periods they only take the progestogen for two weeks out of four and quite often they notice that they don't feel so good whenever yeah. they've taken the combined part of the treatment. So it really mimics PMS and so maybe mood not so good, breast tenderness, irritability, and sometimes the night sweats and things come back a bit as well whenever they're on the progestogen. But they have to take that if they have a uterus. It's just very to... important they take it, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Um, Kate, there's a really very long personal question that we've been sent in, which is absolutely fascinating, and I, but I, I know that and I know you've answered it online that we, we simply don't have an answer because it's so complicated to do with mast cells and and really severe hypersensitivity to progesterone. But there's a really important part, Karen Udick, and I hope I've pronounced your names properly. Does early menopause before 40 affect the rates of progression of someone's MS, either for the better or for worse? So premature menopause and MS, do we know? So it's a really, really good question. And I have a, a, a sadly short answer is that we don't really know. Yeah, I, I have to say, I, I, yeah, I I'm thought worried. that was the answer. But I know I keep saying I don't know, and I don't know, we need more evidence. I think uh, just to show it, throw in some good news at this point is that there there is research going on. So one of my colleagues in London, Ruth Dobson, is doing uh, is supporting a PhD student at the moment uh, where they are looking at how women with, women with MS experience the menopause and how it in, impacts having a chronic disease with this so whilst we don't have the answers currently we are looking for those answers and we hopefully you know by interrogating big ms registries like the uk ms register we will hope to get these answers but we just don't have them right now 
And I, and I think that that's important that we recognize we don't know, but it's, it is reassuring someone living with MS to know that there is just a colossal amount of research going on around the world and within the UK yeah. on all sorts of aspects of living with MS. And, and, I, and I feel like reproductive health, women's health is getting that place slowly. You know, family planning, pregnancy, yeah. all of these things, which I know we're not deliberately going to touch on today. There's there's a really big push. And I can see that in the research community on that one now. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that menopause and post-reproductive health is getting it too. Um, I, I want, to, I know we've talked a little bit about um, the earlier you start HRT, the better, just because you have MS doesn't mean you should start HRT. But if someone, Kate, comes into you and says, I'm now in my, hypothetically, I'm now in my mid fifties and I've had MS for 20 years, but my bladder symptoms are getting much, much worse. And I have a little bit, and I have some night flushes or and all this, the sweating and all of those sorts of things. Do you think it's reasonable to say a trial of HRT and, and see what it does? Because I feel Absolutely. like the, I feel like there's going to be a lot of people with MS who are going to have to bridge the gap first and come to their neurologist and say, what do you think about HRT? I, I, I know that you would, but I don't think many would say, have you thought about HRT as an option? And I'm not saying it's their responsibility to do so, but, you know, do you know what I mean? I do know what you mean, and I, and I do think in some ways it maybe is our responsibility to do this, and then, and again, back to empowering women. And so I, I now look at someone's, I mean, I always look at someone's age, but I more consciously look at someone's age when they're kind of, with, depending on the type of symptoms that they're coming, but if it's cognitive, kind of brain fog, um, and or you're increasing urinary symptoms, and if they're aged between the age of kind of four, particularly between the age of 45 and 55, I will say, well, have you considered hormonal factors? And, you know, if, and we, then we'll have a talk about it and I'll say, well, listen up, I think it's reasonable to go back to your GP and have a discussion about HRT and, and that might help some of these other symptoms as well. I don't promise it's going to, because I can't tell whether some of those symptoms may be due to their MS. So I would go down a normal kind of MS bladder scan, that yeah. kind of route as well. But, you know, it's in a way, this makes me sound lazy, but it's much easier to treat it as if it were um, menopause and and um, maybe give some HRT or whether that's transdermal or even vaginal, particularly if if it's urinary symptoms, which can be given really safely, even if people do have a history of breast cancer, um, then that's really important. And we had this discussion earlier that I, I think when I've given talks about this and I've had male colleagues say, oh, this was really interesting. I don't really think about this. So it is important we talk about it more and we, you know, we educate our particularly, I think, I don't think I'd be unfair in saying this, our male colleagues and to the importance of these, these issues, but it's also not fair to just offload that onto the female members of the team. And it's incumbent on male colleagues to, you know, to be comfortable about talking about this and you know we don't have to know an awful lot you just need to be aware that it may be an issue and then be able to say well look I you know I'm I don't I I I have learned a lot more about HRT and menopause but you know it's just about saying considering it as an option and then directing people in the right in the right direction. I think that's um very honest actually and fair of you to you know to say to, to actually say well, it's easier to treat menopause than MS. I, I, I think that most people with MS would appreciate hearing that. I know that I certainly would if I were menopausal and had MS. So I, I wouldn't be afraid of saying that to anybody. I, and it sounds like what you're saying is, you know, you, you have to be a trial of one. And if it works for you, that's fantastic. And if it doesn't, we have to go back to the drawing board. But there's nothing to be lost and potentially quite a lot to be gained by just having that conversation in the first place. Johnny, can I just say a bit about local estrogen? I suppose that you could, Siobhan, yes. <laughs> Just because not, not everybody has the, the other basal motor symptoms and the other issues or, or wants or needs systemic HRT. Um, vaginal symptoms are what we call genital urinary syndrome of the menopause now. Can be vaginal dryness, can be increased urinary frequency, nocturia, run to the toilet at night, um, increased incontinence, which obviously all can be MS-related as well, um, vulval discomfort, itch on the outside as well. And it can be very successfully treated with local vaginal estrogen, which is tablets or creams, gels or, or rings that can be inserted. And they don't cure the problem, so they need to be used 
long term. There's no point giving somebody a course of three months and expecting them to get on with it for the rest of their life. You know, so I part of me actually thinks that all women who don't go on systemic HRT should at least consider using local estrogen because these other bladder and vaginal symptoms can be a longer term consequence. They may not actually start until much later after the menopause. Yeah, yeah, and just yeah, and that's just such, it's it's another thing that people need to be thinking about whenever they do. I'm a massive fan of using topical estrogen, even for those that say, "Oh no, but I've got breast cancer," and I can very confidently yeah. say that that's okay. Yeah, maybe the thing that gives you a little bit of relief from your you know urge incontinence symptoms or or vaginal discomfort or whatever that might be, but think about that person who is up ten times a night to go to the to the bathroom and therefore gets no sleep and i mean we all know what that does to the average person but for someone living with ms that could be devastating yeah. and it's such a simple thing that could be fixed yeah or at least improved significantly and make such a huge difference i think and i think that's why conversations like these are just so so important um, unfortunately a lot of women are too embarrassed and don't they're certainly not going to mention it to their neurologist you know they don't want to mention it to their gp so it's not going to be the sort of thing they're going to mention to their neurologist okay, sorry, and i think gonna... some people are really grateful so so i've had patients who you know when i've broached you know do you think it could be your hormones you kind of but i, I think they thought i think they were mad if they brought it up uh, whereas it's it's completely the opposite. And I think there's a danger of you don't want to be blaming everything on the hormones, obviously, and kind of dismissing other symptoms, but recognising where they may be relevant is our job and is really important. I couldn't agree more. Um, Kate, Siobhan, can I thank you very, very much for what I hope has been a useful conversation? I've certainly enjoyed it immensely, and I feel like I've learned a lot about HRT and I've learned some more stuff about MS too, which, which I'm very grateful for. Do you have anything that you, any take home message that you want to give to our audience or anything you feel like we haven't just quite touched on um, or missed or glossed over? Um, the, the best website for information for women about menopausal symptoms and HRT would be the Women's Health Concern, which is the patient's arm of the British Medical or British Menopause Society. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. Um, well, then, Kate, have you any any last remarks or thoughts? No, it was just I think just for for women if they if they are concerned that their symptoms may be menopausal to not be afraid about asking their neurologist, but perhaps not expect everybody to be quite as well informed yet. We are working on it. <laughs> perhaps they'll listen to, uh, but also maybe maybe not. Uh, but, but to certainly ask the question, but also empowered to, to ask their GPs, where I think who have the kind of power to, to perhaps prescribe the HRT as well. So that would be my advice. Brilliant. Well, um, Kate, Siobhan, thank you so much for joining us on the Overcoming MS YouTube channel. I'm very grateful to you and I know that our community will be too once they get to hear it. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, Johnny, pleasure. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of Living Well with MS. Please check out this episode's show notes at overcomingms.org slash podcast. You'll find useful links and bonus information there. Have questions or ideas to share? Email us at podcast at overcomingms.org. Or you can reach out to Jeff on Twitter at Jeff Alex. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks again for tuning in and see you next time for tips on living a full and happy life with MS.